While standard awaits rotation, we're back to the Pioneer Nation. Did Absent Amalia tank? Come see where it ranked. It only counts if it mounts. Comment below as we walk through the Week 11 recap of Outlaw Pioneer. Alrighty gang, there were 10 Pioneer tournaments that we looked through as we assembled our tier list this week. At the forefront was Mono Green Devotion, racking up 8 top 8s in a trophy. Next up was Is It Phoenix with 10 top 8s, followed by Rakdos Vampires with 12 top 8s. And the final deck in tier 1 was Gruel Prowess, boasting only 5 top 8s but 2 trophies nonetheless. In tier 2, we highlight the continued performance from Azoria Spirits, which snagged five top eights and a trophy this past week. In a shift from the tempo world back to control, we see Azorius Control hold steady with another four top eights and a single trophy. Then it's on to Abs and Amalia, grabbed four top eights, but failed to convert a trophy. Last but not least, we have Mono Black Waste Knot. Now, while Waste Knot only had two top eight appearances across those 10 events, it did manage to take down the largest Pioneer tournament of the weekend, which raises its profile significantly in our estimation. And finally, onto the Brewer's Corner we go, where we found four spicy Pioneer lists, starting with Aserac Combo and Storm Herald Combo, both lists looking to chain a couple key cards together to rock the competition. Then over in Aggro Land, we see Mardu Aggro Brew and an RCQ winning Abzan Elves list as well. Stay tuned, gang. It's going to be a good one today. Now onto our Tier 1 Archetype Breakdowns, starting with Green Devotion. Sugimoto Takashi took down the Admiral Championship in Kawasaki, Japan this past weekend with Green Devotion, making them the sole pilot of the archetype to snag a trophy this week. So let's walk through what they did well with this list. First and foremost, I want to focus over here. There's this beautiful little card called Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, and I'm going to call it the Mother of Mirror Matches. Also really good at destroying Amalia combo, which I love. Next up on this list that's worth considering, Hostile Hostile. I know, everyone looks at this card and they're like, why the <laughs> hell is this in Green Devotion? It's a sack outlet, gang. It's there because sometimes you have to sacrifice old growth trolls just to get a little mana bump, and sometimes you gotta sacrifice those Cavalier of Thorns so you can get the right card on top of your library from your graveyard. It's really why it's there. I know it looks weird. Uh, Emmercool continues to sit around in the sideboard, wrecking every combo and control player's dreams. And for some reason, we have two different builds of Nyssa here, both of which seem to fit. So I don't know, It's it's got some interesting pieces to it, but ultimately, ah, it, it's nothing too new. Mean green on top, I love to see it. What, what would you really attribute this deck's most recent successes to? I mean, we've seen a decline in Abs and Amalia, and Abs and Amalia is the worst matchup for Mono Green Devotion because you're fundamentally trying to push through on value and they don't give a shit about your value. They don't care at all. <laughs> they are just going to blow up the board and win the game. So Green Devotion really flourishes when you don't have to deal with specific combo decks and you get to grind against other value-based engines. And because this is a Green Devotion list that can explode so quickly, it can get ahead of a lot of the control lists that traditionally would have kept it in check. All right, all right, thank you. And uh, let's move on. Phoenix lives to Is It Phoenix? Apologies if I mispronounce this. Yorgi managed to, I don't know if that's the name, it's J O R G E E, gang, managed to top four finish with Is It Phoenix over the 127 player Magic Con Cup in Amsterdam this past weekend. While there was an RCQ winning list available as well in the US, I'm going to go ahead and take the top four finish out of 127 players over a first place finish out of a 13 player RCQ all season long. Now, I look at this list there's not a whole lot to dissect. It's not like these lists are changing heavily for Phoenix. I, I think there's just a few things we need to talk about. First, there's no basic mountain, which tells me that there is not a lot of punishment for non-basic lands in this format. Like if you look at standard, for instance, there was a lot of punishment in the form of Field of Runes that kept a lot of that in check, but we're not seeing it in Pioneer. Secondly, the 1-1 one -one split with Anger of the Gods and Brotherhood's End I find particularly fascinating, especially as there's a 2-2 split of Fiery Impulse to Torch the Tower. So we're seeing kind of this hedge towards exiling, but also you want to keep the Brotherhood's End for those Is It Artifact lists, etc., that are going to push that dynamic. All right, and 
I look at this list, you're right. Not too many differences from iteration to iteration, but I do see that single copy of Aether Gust in the sideboard. And we've talked about this card in the long past uh, about its, its relative effectiveness. Do you think this is an effective card against green or any other deck right now? I, I think it's absolutely effective against green devotion. I think it's very effective against uh, Amalia. And to a degree, it's going to be effective against Rakdos lists when you're trying to counter cards like Fable. Even if you're only doing it for one turn for a tempo base scenario, I can see where this comes in. But frankly, I think it's here mostly for Green Devotion and Amalia, where you are, you're countering the key spells. Just flat out, you're getting the Cocos, the Chords, mm. and Green Devotion, literally everything they have. So it's a tempo spell. You only really want one of it. It's not a hard counter, but it, it suits you well for that. Okay, yeah, that, that explains the one of. That was really the main the main thrust of my question there, but thank you. Uh, let's move on to another list doing really well right now. Rakdos Vampires. So, Luca G managed a semifinal finish in the Netherlands this past weekend with Rakdos Vampires. It was business as usual with this list, returning to a classic look that pushes consistency over Broncos or Trees. So, again, you get into these lists, there's not a lot of flex slots, right? We're seeing that 1-1 one -one split with Kalidas and Shelly. I don't know that I really like playing Shieldred in this deck at this point. I love Kalidas. You know, like, we, we have this card that is a vampire, fits the Soren vampire theme. It can come out on turn three because of that. And as a turn three, three, four lifelinker that exiles, you're you're scaring the crap out of Amalia and Phoenix once this hits. That's why I'm thinking I want more copies because also green devotion. Mm. Your old growth trolls aren't going to the graveyard anymore. Your cavaliers aren't having death effects. Like you are shutting down so much by doing this card. So I'm really unsure why we're pushing Shelly instead of just another Kalidus in the main. Outside of that, the four ley line in the void is also in that vein of we are not letting the graveyard get out of control. And you even have an Ashiok in there as well. There's a lot of hate for graveyards in this. Yeah, I, I yeah, I note that. That's uh, that's interesting. Explains a lot, actually. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, this turned out to be the better of the two Rakdos piles, right? So why do you think that is? I think fundamentally there are two big pieces that made this win out over your average Rakdos pile. The first is that you get to do something unfair at three mana. And in Pioneer, getting an unfair effect at three mana is almost always going to be a better scenario than trying to have absolute stability because this is a game of variance and the fact that your six drop can come out on turn three but you're totally fine waiting until turn five or six and you have fables to ramp like there is so much synergy in ways to make that powerful effect hit that i i get why it's starting to win out it makes sense yeah yeah i concur uh let's talk about the last list in our tier one archetypes rule prowess Chris Hammond took down a 20-player RCQ in Mankato, Minnesota this past weekend with Gruel Prowess. Also, shout out to Minnesota. Hello, Midwest. Uh, in this, I'd really like to just focus on the fact that we have a Collision Colossus in the main. This is a really fun little hedge that you get because it's going to accelerate your primary goals correctly. You know, you get the plus four, plus two trample. That's lovely. But if they if they land that early Vein Ripper, sometimes you're willing to take the hit and lose a Soul Scar Mage and Collision it just the hell out. And you, like it's just it is what it is you have to acknowledge that there are broken starts and this is a way to mitigate that decently so i like that as a main board hedge that doesn't really make you sacrifice a slot for your main game plan as well i'm i'm a little confused why there's a 2-2 blossoming defense snakeskin veil split i i'm not sure exactly why that is why they didn't go to the traditional four blossoming defense what it was about that extra plus one plus one counter that made it seem more palatable than the extra point of damage on blossoming defense but it's there. Yeah, I'm curious about that as well. Another card I'm curious about, I see Red Cat Melee, you know, you, not, not a card you typically see uh, lately. What what does this come in against and, and how do you use it? I mean, Red Cat Melee is probably there for the mirror more than anything else. It's yeah. the acknowledgement that for one mana, you need to be able to kill a Slick Shot even after they've Monstrous Raged. Um, you need to have something that is interacting very cheap and it's not completely dead. There are a lot of people that look at Red Cat Melee and they think, I can only play this, uh, you know, if it's hitting red creatures. It's not the case. Once upon a time, we used Red Cat Melee to deal with Night Pack Ambusher because there was no other one mana answer for that card. And you were willing to lose a Mountain and a Red Cat Melee just to deal with that card because it was such a big deal. So occasionally you get to that point where there are specific threats that you just have to answer. 
and it's worth the two for one against yourself to keep that tempo going, which with rule prowess, that makes a lot of sense because we are a tempo deck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for introducing that nuance to the conversation. I, I, I concur there as well. That's, that's very interesting. That does it for our tier one archetypes. Uh, let's go ahead and jump down into tier two, where I'll start things with Azori's Spirits. Ikiyami Shingo took down the Champions Cup Premium Qualifier in Sanomiya, Japan, about a week ago with this list. This this was the single trophy for the deck in a week of several other top eight appearances, but definitely a, a big win there. Uh, look, I, I love the Spirits cards in here. I love the full sets. Mausoleum Wanderers, Rattle Chains, Spell Quellers, each of these creatures add to your board state, but they resist what the opponent is going to try to do to, to suppress you, which is board wipes and, and you know single targeted removal. They can resist those sorts of things. Uh, I do love the one three steps ahead here uh, for the mode, especially in creating copies of spirits. Uh, should you need it in the late game, it gains value as the match moves on. Um, and also, I mean, I just listed the kinds of spirits that you can copy. Any more of these, and you know, along with your uh, your, your anthem effects, this it be, makes it even more powerful. Uh, I also like the one of Katilda here. I think it's positioned well in this meta, right? You're dealing with a tier one vampires list. <laughs> so this card having protection against vampires is pretty cool. And also the three Muta Vaults adding to the board as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Katilda. In a world filled with Vayne Ripper, Katilda just laughs. Just laughs and goes, okay, as long as you don't have a wrath effect to back it up, we are bigger, we have lifelink, we will get there. So I, I love where that is. But I, I look at this archetype, and it's Max, it's been slowly rising in popularity for mm -hmm. quite a while now, honestly, as the season has worn on. Is there any particular reason for that in your opinion? Um, I think, honestly, it's just a lean, fast, aggro list that also resists control. Uh, and so those two factors alone, you know, you're, you're rewarded right now in this meta for playing aggro. It's paying, off, it's paying dividends to a lot of players. We're seeing more aggro lists. This list in particular, you know, resists the the anti aggro uh, just enough. We're also seeing combo style decks, decks with large pieces that are important to the combo. Uh, this deck can sort of counter those key spells uh, and still put in a decent fight with the evasive creatures that that can get it done. So in a way, we're looking at a deck that is almost a mirror of what Is It Phoenix is doing in terms of tempo and disruption, mm -hmm. but it's not graveyard centric, so it doesn't have some of those same weak points. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah, yeah, because we are seeing some graveyard hate. Fair, fair. Well, let's look at another deck that does not care about the graveyard and will punish you. Azori's Control. It was another odd week for Control. Single trophy for Azori's with a handful of other top eight appearances for the non-Lotus version of Azorius. Uh, but let's discuss where this deck is aiming to position itself this time around. Of course, we have two Dovin's Vetoes with a with four no more lies so six total two cost counter spells these are you know these are your most efficient your best counter spells uh in the early game and then of course two cops is three steps ahead which as i just said gains value as the match wears on allows you to draw more into your into your library uh of course that's valuable for control as you get into the mid game late game phase and then i love the one settle the wreckage we are we are seeing an increase in aggro aggro archetypes uh exile based removal is awesome and so it kind of avoids that, oh, I'm going to hex proof my uh, slick shot. Uh, it kind of avoids that, gets around that. So uh, Sell the Wreckage is a good response to the Gruel Prowess deck, I think, in, in particular. One farewell. Uh, graveyard hate is very important right now, very significant. Uh, it's sort of what's taking down Abzan Amalia in a way. So the one farewell, I like where that's placed. So, Max, I look at this, and we've got four top eights and a single trophy yet again for Azorius Control. I mean, that is consistent as hell. That is week after week, exact same setup. Is this actually a Tier 1 archetype in principle, and it's, you know, just unpopular, or is it is it supposed to be in Tier 2? I think there's a couple of factors at play here. First, I think uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction has introduced some some go fast play, some rewards for that. I'm, I'm thinking of the prowess decks, um, and so the quick archetypes tend to do well against Gazorius Control traditionally. But I think even more significantly, uh, this is a deck that requires some expert level piloting. Right? We mentioned earlier how uh, this pioneer right now is rewarding aggro players. Uh, with a lot more wins and a lot more consistency. And so to be able to successfully pilot Azorius Control takes a lot. Uh, you know, every win is an effort that you have to make. So um, I don't know. I think that reason alone, players are a little bit dissuaded from playing Azorius Control right now. 
Fair. I mean, it, it is not an easy deck to play. The punishment's high. It's usually games that you lose for a misstep, so it, it makes it difficult to justify as a steep learning curve. I, that makes a lot yep. of sense. Let's move on to another deck with more of a steep learning curve than I think a lot of people understand, and that is Abs Animalia. What a busy week for Amalia combo, as it, it really made a huge mark in terms of its number of appearances at MagicCon, at other events surrounding MagicCon. Uh, this list in particular by Mitchell87 is the sole one that made it to the top eight. Others did as well, did, you know, did pretty well in other much smaller events, uh, but only one earned a first place finish this past weekend, thus we relegate this to tier two. Surprise, surprise there. But let's see what's going on with this build. We are seeing the one lively dirge make a return, two return to the ranks, and two extraction specialists making up the reanimation suite. We talked about how much Graveyard Hay is coming back. That may be one of the reasons why Amalia has suffered. We've got the one selfless savior in here to protect your, you know, your pieces, your important pieces. The four chords of calling, three collected companies. I believe that's become standard for the deck. Uh, and then we're also, I, I'm intrigued by the two Tameo safekeeping in the sideboard. You are going to need that sort of protection and life gain all in one card uh, for this deck. I'm also intri intrigued by something I, I, I don't think I've seen before. Maybe it's been there before, but I, I haven't seen the Remorseful Cleric in the sideboard, which is also a piece of graveyard hate, I guess, for the mirror. And I mean, Remorseful Cleric's been in and out. Uh, you're right. It's something you may or may not have seen because it's been like a one of that comes in and out of that sideboard every time I take a look at it. And sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. It is what it is. But I look at Amalia, and we haven't seen it perform very well recently, Max. Has the hate for Amalia finally done it in? You know, like, is there splash hate coming mm. from other archetypes that, that has led to this giant fall off the map? Or what? what is happening here? I think we talked about that last week, right? There, you know, we were starting to see like one ofs uh, being splashed around different decks, uh, sideboard pieces aimed at Amalia. Amalia had the target on its back. Um, so any sort of graveyard egg or uh, graveyard exile or exile based removal effects are going to hit this deck pretty hard. Uh, red in particular also has uh, the red color also has you know decks like mono red and gruel among others using cards like Ferocidon, Quakebringer, uh, Roiling Vortex we mentioned last week really to cut off Amalia at the life gain. And then we're also seeing Ashiok in multiple sideboards, uh, Phoenix, Vampires, and Azorius to name a few. So I, I think that's having an effect. Okay, so we do we do have a lot of splash hate that's just coming in off of almost every archetype, and it makes sense. Let's be honest, we've played against Amalia enough to know that people hate it and they love to hate it. You know, it's one of those decks. It's like when Pod was in Modern, everybody loved to hate Pod. It just is what it is. Uh, but with that, let's move to the deck that is pure haterade itself, Waste Not. So while Waste Not has made a few appearances at major events, uh, very few actually, it did take down the 127 player cup at MagicCon Amsterdam, grinding it out to an 8-1-1 one, and one finish. Cret to Fabe, 111 for this version of the list. And now while these new Challenge Cup events at MagicCon allow you know amateurs, pretty much anyone to come in and show off what they've built, uh, those decks tend to be slightly more experimental, right? Uh, this deck, however, give it credit, slugged it out with the most popular archetypes to really seize the day. I mean, I, I look at the top eights, and it, there were there were some major archetypes in there. We've got two duress, four thoughts, these three go blanks to make up the suite of hand hate cards. Pair that, of course, the three Lianas, two hostile investigators, uh, and that makes up the core of the deck. Two damping spheres in the sideboard, I think, are doing work, slowing down some of the ghost go fast decks such as Prowess. Uh, I'm also seeing two Knight of Dust Shadow shutting down the life gain, shutting down Amalia. Kalitas as well in the sideboard, doing that sort of work too to make sure that you know the, those cards are gone once you remove them. And then three Bank Busters, a card we don't see too often anymore in Pioneer, but three Bank Busters for card advantage. So, Max, we saw this take down 127 player competitive pioneer event, arguably the largest one of this past weekend, and yet it's it's tier two. Why is that, in your opinion? To put it very simply, uh, it it sits at about two percent of the pioneer meta overall. So, for whatever reason, not too many people are experimenting with this control archetype. Um, maybe for the same reason that Azorius control isn't seeing as much play as it was, um, but. Hand hate itself is a risky game plan, uh, especially in light of decks running hot, you know, getting top decking their answers, decks like Prowess really doing their thing very quickly. And that scenario where the opponent is running hot, this deck just can't keep up and it can't put the pieces on the board to really smash through and get it done in time. Fair. 
Fair. And that's that's traditionally been the issue when you get into a Jund-esque scenario of limited resources. Top decks are king. If you limit everybody's resources and we don't have Armageddon, you know, around anymore to just wipe out the lands and keep top decks from mattering. So, yeah, sometimes they just top deck out of it. Uh, that said, we're going to go to our final segment here. Love this one. Brewer's Corner. Let's kick things off with a little Asarax Logurk combo. So... What I, what I see when I look at a deck like this is, honest to God, somebody loved Slogurk way too much in Standard and said, I'm not done. <laughs> like, we are going to build a version of Pioneer, so help me God. And so they went and combined it with this card called Asarak, the Arch Lich. The idea with this is that you can go infinite. Okay, people look at this and they're like, oh, so you venture into the Tomb of Annihilation. No, never go into the Tomb <laughs> of Annihilation. It is aptly named. Never go in there. It's not the right dungeon for you. I... I guarantee you it's the wrong dungeon every time so you go into any other dungeon and you can just keep on doing this where you bounce it back because it'll self bounce every time it doesn't complete the tomb of annihilation so if you have rona rutstein relic and Asarak, you have an infinite combo how slogurk fits into this is kind of uh, you know it, it's value it's mostly value i think it's so that you can get takanuma's running and you can bring back Asarak so they keep killing it and you keep going mm -mm, not today and just go right back at him over and over again. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. I remember when that card, uh, a heavy play in Arena when it first came out. So I, that version of it used to bother the heck out of me. So I, I can imagine what this deck can do if it gets going. But uh, let's move on and talk about a list, uh, a Kaladesh style list, a Mardu Agro, Kret to Zweigel. I, Sorry if I mispronounced that, but Mardu Vehicles is sort of a pioneer port of an older tier one standard archetype. Uh, in the one drop slot, we've got Bomat Courier, allowing you to extend your hand into the late game if need be. Great for an aggro deck. Uh, also in that one drop slot, Toolcraft Exemplar. Perfect complement to it, honestly. And it's a dwarf. Uh, we've got Smuggler's Copter. Can feed your graveyard uh, to you know work with Scrap Heap Scrounger to return to the battlefield. Crew your vehicles. Um, we've also got four Veteran Motorists. Great for a vehicle deck. Uh, great creature to crew from. Boost your vehicle's attacks. Uh, Nepala also boosts your vehicle's attacks. And more importantly, fetches dwarves and vehicles for those attacks. So you're really creating an engine here uh, no pun intended. Uh, two <laughs> Gideons. I remember how much this card used to hassle me just in other like mono whitelists, but Gideon here can pilot Heart of Kiron. You can remove the counter and then plus one the vehicle, notably all in one turn. And, and then of course, three unlicensed hearse. It's graveyard hate, but it actually fits into the deck. It's not just superficial graveyard hate. So uh, that intrigues me. I mean, I, I remember when that deck was a tier one standard deck driving everybody up a wall. Um, yeah, Heart of Quran, Smuggler's Copter being in the same format again. I figured it was a matter of time before somebody dusted this <laughs> off and really went after it. I have no idea if it's good enough, but I know that it's spicy. So, you know, dear listener, take some time, have some fun, crew some vehicles with some dwarves. Is there anything more fun in Magic than doing random shit like that? I don't think so. <laughs> exactly. And with that, let's move on to the next combo deck, Storm Herald Combo. All righty, gang. So Storm Herald is how you are winning games. The idea here is that you are going to dump two Colossifications. Well, actually, you only need one. A Colossification and a Burning Anger into your graveyard. You're going to get a Storm Herald out, which is going to bring back both of these auras right onto it, which means you're going to get to tap it to deal 21 points. Or no, it's 23 points of damage. Yeah. With burning anger so yeah that's it that's the whole deck the <laughs> whole point behind this deck is to do that so you have obviously a delirium based uh, archetype because you are trying to fill the grave very quickly and use that to search out the key pieces of the combo that you do not have between gather the pack being able to use spell mastery and traverse you should be able to find your storm heralds fables there for value i guess and that seems fine i mean you're in red why wouldn't you play fable that seems to be the common consensus when it comes to any format with fable in it so yeah. i i don't know i i think this is pretty narrow but if people aren't hating the grave which they are currently but let's say they stop uh, yeah it could be fun <laughs> it could be fun yeah it looks any any deck with Stam storm herald can that can make that card work seems fun to me but uh let's talk about a shaman of the pack deck abzan elves Another card that, you know, can be really fun if you can make it work. Credit to Elliot Bourgeret, uh, who won a 16-player RCQ in France with the list. 
Uh, I, I just want to note here the one drops that you know you don't see too often, uh, Stalwart and Jaspara Sentinel. Uh, those really make sure you that you have the one green mana every single time that you bring something in for the uh, with the Leaf Crown Visionary that you're drawing cards. They really help you to achieve that. Also, in conjunction with Elvish War Master, right? You're getting those one ones, so you're able to tap down you know draw the extra cards the mana base notably because it's a kindred deck gets to utilize the four caverns four secluded courtyards four unclaimed territories for 19 lands total um really just the the mana base is awesome here um and also actually allows you enables you to play a lot of these one-offs in the sideboard these one-off utility creatures like the the knight of dust shadow the mist caller the phyrexian revoker the guardian of faith uh since you can on the spot kind of select those creature types with those lands four cords of calling bring out the shaman of the pack to finish things off and notably where fox bodyguard also an elf i i totally forgot about that i know right the elf fox knight you gotta love the design <laughs> on that one wizards and with that we're gonna get to our final segment predictions for the upcoming week now max we've looked at 12 archetypes tonight what are our predictions going into week 12 of outlaw pioneer yeah so the gatekeepers at the top are clearly defined at this point, right? With their presence, we're seeing meta-defined brewing occurring. With pilots trying to find ways to take tier 1.5 and tier 2 decks through the gauntlet with just subtle positioning of those flex slots. And I mean, these tier 2-esque decks are extremely meta-dependent as pilots are gambling on hitting the expected matchups where they have hefty advantages based on their builds. A prime example of this is Waste Not, uh, which won in Amsterdam. Yeah, if a deck like Waste Knot hits the right matchups, it's damn near impossible to stop. But if it suddenly gets paired against a deck like Rule Prowess, then the odds become stacked against it, right? Thus, now that we know what the top fair decks are in the meta, we're seeing how people attack the top with their tier two gambles, so to speak. Yeah, so our prediction is metagames filled with hate for the top three in particular, but the hate will come from a variety of minor archetypes that may or may not hit the right matchups. So if you're piloting a deck in the top three, you should have a pretty clear idea what your matchups are and why, so you can choose whether to shore up those defenses or allow the unfavorable margins to exist in order to dominate other archetypes. Yep, and with that, we thank you for supporting us. Another week in the books, special shout out to our members who subscribe to our channel monthly. Be sure to comment below. Let us know if you're enjoying all the Pioneer content while we await standard rotation. Rictus does have to take a business trip, so we'll be back in two weeks with more analysis. Until next time, Rebels. Untap, upkeep, resist. Resist.